So, welcome everyone and uh, to our final session of today's Agile 100 online conference. Um, Evelyn Tian uh, was so kind to uh, donate her time to us and make herself available, and we're very excited to host her. Evelyn, similar to Zuzi and myself, is a member of our global trainers and coaches community. Um, I got to know her actually at one of our global scrum gatherings of three, four, five years ago, probably. She is one of those um, really like global citizens, uh, Chinese born, grew up in Canada, now lives in Sweden. And she worked at, at Ericsson for 21 years, led the overall um, enterprise transformation, and now has her own consulting company. And she, she's joining us, I think, from Stockholm right now. So, Evelyn, we're super excited to host you. We're very much looking forward to your, to your, fine, to your, to your basically closing keynote of today's um, conference. And I'll hand the stage over to you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Sarat, for the introduction. Hi, good morning. I guess good evening. Thank you so much for uh, joining my session. So uh, I will be discussing about uh, the uh, ins inspiration track. And here is a snapshot of who I am. And then I coach most of the time in organization and also run some public workshops on agile leadership, Scrum, and to help passionate practitioners just like you to grow. And then through my own company in Sweden, I also have a mentoring program. Now I have uh, participants from 68 countries. I'm working ways to grow their um, uh, grow themselves uh, in the area of agile, either agile product owner or agile coaching. So in addition, I also volunteer as advisor to IEEE software board, focusing on agile and also large scale development. Yeah. And then here's a helicopter view. And as you know, uh, you certainly have had that experience, uh, a helicopter view to anywhere and everything looks fantastic. So now if we start to take a helicopter view of Agile, people talk about the newest and latest practices and inspirations, such as design thinking, innovation, minimum viable product, product discovery, and the list is very long. As a coach and consultant, I have the opportunity working with different organizations and have the privilege to zoom in and work with them for continued improvement. So I speak about my experience and learning from my work. And last year, I uh, keynoted at the Global XP Conference, I had a, a topic called Agile Mushroom in Tibet. So I, that topic, I try to focus on organize, organization level challenges. And today, we will be zooming in a few topics at a different level. And uh, just to have some fun and also it's truly important for me as a coach. So we will be focusing on takeaway messages. So uh, we will run a small uh, competition because for me it's important and I will really feel very satisfied and fulfilled if you can have some takeaway messages from the session and start to make some differences in the organization you're working in. So we have a little competition at the end of the session about takeaway messages. And now let's take a look at the rough uh, structure. So I will be discussing about a few inspirations. And so it's going to go with a story about inspiration and zooming into it and take some uh, summary messages. And then go back, talk about another inspiration, zooming in and also summary. And then now let's get started with the first one. So the first story is about an engagement I had with a large organization. So uh, I first went in for a short introdu introduction session before I got started officially the week after. And then I just wanted to understand where they are at that moment. And then when I was hearing introduction about how they actually have done their reorganization, re, you know, establish um, business line, product line, and also the introduction of chief product owner and the product owner role and the mentioning of, all, of how they re, try to reorganize about uh, value flow. At that moment, my heart was seriously beating faster. I was 
talking to myself, oh my, this is going to be the first advanced company I'll be working with on their agile journey. So with a level of excitement and also a bit anxious to really want to know more about that. So I started and I gradually managed to grasp the whole picture. To see how the value flow is truly working through my experience as well. So first, if we take a look at the concept about flow. So taking that into product and service development. And the flow, we're talking about the movement of the development for product, could be a service, could be a solution through an organization, which is a great concept. And we want to see how an organization will help them to identify how things are flowing today and how value is going through the organization today and also start to reflect to see how they can better organize themselves around the value. So it's a great concept. And then, uh, then now let's zoom in a bit. So at high level, this is what we see. So from a helicopter view, hearing all the effort that we're putting in, it's really, it's really great. And now what happened is that when I start to work and I zoom in, so as you see, after we zoom in, the picture is rather different. So we actually see organization silos, islands, and then to make islands working better, there's, you know, front office, back office, and middle office, so have parts to connect these, and added functions, and you know, additional coordination roles to make a value flow, and then also there's uh, increased dependency. So as a result of that, a lot of frustration, as you can imagine, so when I was trying to have uh, individual conversations with people, I hear frustration, I hear people were commenting, I've been working with the company, the company for this many years, very long, and we were able to deliver before, and now delivering requires so much extra work. Meetings, uh, coordinations, and then also the increased dependency frustrated many as you could imagine so now that's the uh, story and also zooming in so now if we take a look at the summary so with regards to value flow so thinking about how value is created and reflection around it is truly 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 very powerful and also very valuable and then Truly organize yourself in the organization around the flow of value is super, super beneficial. On the other hand, trying just to talk about it, sort of pretend if I could use, and to try to keep the current status quo um, at the same time will be very, very costly. And ending up with high dependency, frustration, and also very low return on your investment of your time and efforts in the organization. So in short, if you think about it, talking about um, talking about flow, it doesn't really make us uh, it doesn't really make us flow. Yeah? So that's the summary message. So that's a few takeaway message that we have for this uh, uh, the first inspiration. And then Let's move into the second inspiration, also uh, from my uh, coaching experience. So if we continue the discussion about flow, about value, I will tell another story. So while working with another organization, and I was trying to assess where they are and what they have achieved and what they have tried, what they have explored. So when it was time about questions around the value stream mapping, the answer was very confirming. Yes, we did it back a few years ago. It was roughly 2011, they did it already. And then I was exploring around the, what they have achieved. Yes, it helped us with some achievement, some improvement. And then I was zooming into the experience. 
So they use it once, and then uh, in one of the group, which is part of the development organization, it helped with some improvement. So with regards to value stream, it was more or less checked yes for the bigger organization. So it's, it's more like saying, we have done that and we've been there. And then why am I talking about uh, value stream mapping? So the reason I picked this as the second topic to zoom in is because the increased awareness about the value stream. So many of you are working with, or at least have heard about DevOps. So there's mentioning about value stream. And then there's uh, what we see now on the screen that the 2020 agility survey as you see, so many companies have either heard about it, working on it, interested in getting started. So uh, more and more interests are surfacing globally. So it is a great tool, yeah? a great concept, and great inspiration. So uh, it looks more or less like this. So if I look at this, uh, and then the pink or purple person that is a customer. And then the, the circles we're seeing, the lines we're seeing, that is what happens in large organization before we actually um, uh, give, deliver that to customer, either collect you know, dollars. So that's more, normally the concept around order to cash. So how value stream discussion and tools, you can see how that can be beneficial, how nice it could be if it's straight line. Life would be fantastic, isn't it right? And then now let's take a look. Now if we zoom in a bit, and then so I looked into their experience and I look into their data. And uh, what did I see? So first, as you see, so this is how uh, things were when they got started. So before we look into this further, some legend color coding. So in the picture, you see that green is value, where gray is a uh, waste. For the reason of simplicity for our session, we're not quite distinguishing different type of waste in this session, though in real situation, it can be very powerful to do so. Yeah. In short, now you see that's a quick snapshot of how things were when they get started with value stream. Yeah. And then this is how things were after the improvement. So not just now, we just took a look at the before and after. And then now I would like you to think about how do you feel about it? So take about 10 seconds, 15 seconds, look at this, and then to make it easier for you, so this is how it was before they start to use it, the snapshot of a current status quo. And this is how things, you know, uh, were after they did some improvement. And then now let's put them side by side, I think it's easier to compare. Yeah. So what is exactly happening? So, unfortunately, as you might have noticed, that uh, the gray, which is the waste, as you see, is stayed more or less the same. So, with maybe subtle differences, very hard to tell. However, at the same time, you do see that green is shortened. So, what exactly happened here? So. What happens in real life, and it happens to many companies, many organizations have tried it. And one thing is that, unfortunately, in real situation, it's a lot easier to focus on the improvement of what's working and improve on that, which is unfortunate because, as we know, there are particularly talking about large organizations, so many different type of wastes all around. However, it's very likely maybe go beyond organization silo, politics, and psychological uncomfort, and so on. So it's ended up easier to focus on what was working already. And then now if we take a little summary from now on what we have discussed so far, and then so 
it's great that uh, we are looking at uh, continuous improvement and uh, we're working with value stream mapping as a tool. However, value stream mapping is not a tool that you just use it and check it off. Yes, we have done it and uh, then it been there, the end of the story. And the value stream mapping is a tool that helps for continuous improvement. It means we need to do continuous application then for continuous improvement. And then at organization level, when we're looking at the true impact, unfortunately, easier doesn't mean better. And it is easier to make what's working more efficient, however, focusing on the part that we are having trouble with that will bring us so much gain. So uh, for the story from here, so that will be a couple of takeaway messages. And then talking about value stream mapping, there is also another trend. Again, at helicopter view, everything looks fantastic. However, now what happened, if we zoom in again to look for some other type of patterns that require improvement, another thing that comes commonly seen is uh, like this. So the same legend in terms of color. And what is happening here then? So a few value streams for the same value flow. It is again, what happened is easier to keep how things are organized. And organize, uh, try to optimize the parts we have access to, and not to challenge the systems that is code too much. As a result of that, what's happening to us? With all the effort we're putting in, what's happening is we're looking at, unfortunately, sub-optimization. So it happens quite a bit as well for some companies start to work with uh, value stream mapping, however, is only working on certain, is get localized. So it's lead to sub-optimization. So now if we link all messages together for the discussion about value stream, so that will be the takeaway message. So in short, value stream mapping, the whole concept and also the practice is very, very super, super powerful. However, under one precondition, if we use it right, and then to make it really right, it requires some effort, as you can imagine, because there will be frustration, there will be challenges, and then, however, it will be bringing organization a lot of benefits after. So that is the second inspiration I'll be discussing of, I discussed about. And now let's move into inspiration number three. So now let's uh, take a look at another story. So uh, one of the organizations I went into, and uh, one of the first meetings, I was meeting with a group of product owners. So there were a bit over 30 product owners in the workshop, and uh, everybody was doing their introduction. And uh, so it's more goes like, you know, my name is blah, blah, and I am the product owner for XYZ. And then it didn't take long for me to figure out. And given that they only have a few development team, and then it didn't take long for me to figure out that most of them, they were not the real product owners. And then we run another workshop, and then I started to hear some of the participants start to talk about, you know, I'm actually not a product owner, rather I'm actually a stakeholder for this and that. So I experienced this a few times and I actually had a talk at uh, uh, a conference in Finland a couple years ago. The title was uh, Transforming in the Ocean of Product Owner. So now let's take a look at the whole concept of product owner. So product owner, you know, value green and really uh, focus a lot on the product, the services, and the solution your organization is delivering. So it's a great concept. Having one person collaborating with all other intelligence, and that's the person with authority and knowledge and make decisions for the product. So it's a wonderful concept. However, what happened is that um, uh, it happens quite often in reality. 
one product owner per team, and also you might have must have heard about the two or even three product owners for one development team. And that is unfortunately the reality. So now as you see in reality, what happened is you see many, many, many product owners in an organization. And then uh, if we start to look into what's the possible you know, reason for this to happen, and it could be lack of understanding the organization and doing simple transformation by just swapping, okay, this person, this type of profile will be uh, a product owner, start defining a product owner role as such. And then there's also another reason as well. It's due to the great inspiration of Spotify. So the so-called Spotify model, although it doesn't quite actually exist, however, is making that uh, impact. So, uh, so this is the Spotify model that we see. And then what happened is that the, for Spotify, it makes a lot of sense for them to organize themselves this way because of their architecture design from day one. So, however, what happened is that um, people heard about Spotify, got inspired by Spotify, and then start to, if I could use the word, copy Spotify. So some are actually doing it by themselves. Some also, we have some large consultancy company which go out and prescribe a uh, company, their clients, something like this. Um, and then, so therefore, if I have a short story here, uh, one, another client of mine, when they brought me in, they already had over 70 squads and over 70 product owners. And the reason they brought me in was because they started to find trouble delivering product. So when I had the first workshop with our executives and I met a few key people from HR Human Resources, and then the answer to my simple is just free chatting. So the sim answer to my simple, how are you doing, how are things? And the answer were amazingly consistent, busy. And then the follow-up question, and then they answered, yeah, we have been hiring a lot of product owners. So uh, they brought me in because although after they hired all these all the product owners, having everything set up, changing their team names, and then they were having problem to deliver product. And so now let's zoom in and uh, let's do a bit summary. So it's very important when we start to look at multiple teams and working with the product. And one of the first thing we have to look into is what exactly is the product? And the, do we actually need to have a product owner per team? Yeah, after you define your product, things will become clearer. And in most cases, the answer is no, we don't really need one product owner per team because a few teams are building the same product. And then, and also about changing the team name, because now I hear from my students and also my mentee from different country, North America, we're talking about SPAD, about uh, tribes, and the same happens to Asia Pacific, and the same happens in Europe as well. So there is no so-called Spotify model. So following the so-called and also not existing model, will unfortunately lead to problems. For instance, if you did hire, instead for my clients, hire more than 70 product owners, then you realize you don't really need that many after you start to introduce improvement. What do you do with all the 70 plus product owners just hired not so, you know, so long ago? So in short, one way or the other, we're actually creating problems we have to solve in the very near future in some cases. So that is about the third inspiration around product owner and also the so-called Spotify model. And then uh, let's look at the last one. So let's look at the last one that is um, about, I know I'm working as a natural coach as well. However, the next one we'll be discussing is about agile coach. So I work with uh, agile coaches from different uh, continents, different country. And so I have had the privilege to talk to many. 
Normally, a simple opening chatting conversation starts with something like, for instance, how are you doing now as a module coach for blah, blah, product or company and so on. And then the answer is, yeah, I'm doing well. I'm doing quite well. It depends on their personality, of course. Then tell me more. How are things around you now? Uh, my teams are all working with Sprint. They run sprint planning they do their daily scrum and they do, do, do our sprint review and we do our spring retrospective wow great you know uh what else and then my teams are collaborating very well and then um and then they will continue start to talk about how some of the team they work with one through if we talk about hackman uh, team stages went through forming or maybe the team they started to work with they were actually storming and then how they helped them to improve from storming to norming and which is all fantastic and then uh, then they continue ask some questions a conversation continues like this the focus is always on the teams so sometimes you know I run class I joke I said you know um, if I approach, a, for instance, I approach Sorab and I, you know, he's my candidate customer and I tell him, you know, this is my product. It's built by 20 agile teams. Unfortunately, he will not pay me more because the product is built by agile teams or squads or um, scrum teams and he's going to pay for the value of the product. So therefore, now what happened, now if we take a look at the Scrum Master, the Agile Coaching role. So Agile Coach is a role that's becoming more and more popular. So it is indeed a great role, and I have a lot of passion for it. And then that is a role that's supposed to help be able to be the expert about Agile frameworks, Scrum and Kanban, if you're working with product development, having hands-on experience about the XP technical practices, that's definitely all helpful. And also being able to teach, you know, around Scrum, around Kanban, if that's needed, and to mentor if it's needed, and to consult if that's needed, and to facilitate and to use professional coaching skills if that's needed. And all of these we're doing is to help the organization to improve. And then now what happened is that um, if we zoom, we zoom into reality, so uh, I see agile coaches, some of them are working as project manager, but wearing an agile coach hat. And then some of them are working with somewhere in between, a little bit, a little bit, and some are more working as team leaders. Of course, depends on what roles you can organization had before. And then now if I also add in a short story. So I had one of my clients, um, the week, the first week I was there, over lunch table, you know, a few people I just had coaching session with, and we chatted and we were having lunch. And they were doing some chatting. And then, uh, then they said, you know, Evelyn, you're different. So I tried to figure out, you know, I'm different, I'm sort of different, you know, a uh, uh, Canadian living in uh, Sweden. Yes, I'm different. <laughs> and then, uh, then the answer, I was asking them about, you know, what, what, what is the difference? What do you guys see? And then the answer after they talk about, they said, you know, you don't ask us, what do you think? Then they elaborated some other agile coaches they worked with. And then no matter what they asked them, and the default answer was always, what do you think? And then, however, for some situation that they have no clue, they were under a lot of pressure and the energy level was very low. And then um, they have tried different things and then that made them really frustrated. So then what happened is that um, exactly as uh, if you zoom in as an agile coach, and then uh, exactly if you say, you know, this is actually my new thought, because what happened is during COVID, as we know, all work is done virtually. 
So I have a desk that actually I can adjust so they allow me to stand. And I got a balancing board. So what you see now is my balancing board. And this allow me to stand on the balancing board and then help me to exercise a bit. And then at the same time, when I was doing this, it actually helped me to visualize and feel how an, you know, how an agile coach can make use of their skills. So Agile Coach is not project management, you know, is not to do team leading role. And then uh, so exactly what skills that can be important. So now, you know, I drew this with five separate areas. How about if we do a bit of collaboration and interaction? How about if we have a one minute, now exactly 7.30 my time, and then we run one minute from chat window, if you could enter, what do you think, you know, these five different areas about agile coach skill, what do you think they might be? So if you run it roughly for one minute, you can just enter, you know, your immediate thought that comes to you. And then Sarap, I have to bother you to help me to read what came in. So now I have roughly 20 seconds past. So whenever answers come in, so we yeah. get the first one, it says teacher. Fantastic, okay, great. What else? Let's see what else comes in. Now we get mentor, inspire, coach, people developer, Fantastic. Okay, great. We have five more seconds. You can hit the enter if not yet. Facilitator, so advisor. Okay, very Nine. good. Yeah. Yeah, very right. good. Yeah, great. Thank you so much for the input. And uh, then now let's take a look. So, what I have here, and then I believe uh, based on my experience, that's important. Teaching, certainly, because you are. Um, you're the, you know, <laughs> the expert in the area. And at the same time, you, can, you should be able to monitor as well. And there could be also the situation that maybe you have taught. You actually also have mentored. However, given maybe the, for instance, I have experienced why one team, the organization, the energy level was very low already. And there are a lot of pressure and people start to question you know, is it even right to do it? And then to question the strategy of uh, working with Scrum, working with Agile, and then, uh, you know, a balanced situation, I switched to consulting so that I could uh, start to recommend a couple of things so that we can generate some positive energy in the organization and then some faith, some positivity, then the moment possible I switch. And then there's also the area about professional coaching and then and then there's also facilitating. So there are a few of that. And some of you I heard advising, certainly that's cool as well. Yeah. And then now if we talk about what's happening now, is that uh, in addition to you know people are working as uh, agile coach slash project manager and slash and slash. And there is also I see a heavy movement to professional coaching skills. And I took my professional coaching school uh, training about 10 years ago, which I loved a lot. And then it's indeed great. It's not only good for you uh, as a person, it's good for you for work, it's good for you even, for instance, in your uh, uh, private situation with your family, friends, and so on, it's great. And at the same time, I also want to highlight the fact that it is only one of the many skills agile coaches should have. So not the only one. Therefore, taking agile coach, coach you know, if I'm standing on my balancing board metaphor, and um, if you take that to organization level, so it's in the way, you know, standing on it and continuously balancing ourselves to see, you know, assessing the situation, continuously balancing ourselves and to decide, you know, how I will act. Yeah. And then, so now, you know, I see me as an agile coach standing on my balancing board, having the skills, and at the same time that I need to go into an organization. So then what happened is that the next thing 
uh, that's very important is, as I mentioned, many agile coaches are focusing on teams, which is, again, great. And at the same time, we want to see the entire organization as an entire system. So then another thing is important for agile coaches to continuously evaluate which areas of this organization that I should be focusing on. That is something that's important to evaluate. Yeah. And then uh, there's certainly there's a certain trend. For instance, now if you see, take a look at all the possible areas, um, if you see this organization as a large arena, then that's the Agile Coach and on my balancing board. And I assess the situation I could, for instance, as a new Scrum Master, new Agile Coach, most likely I start to work. I feel more comfortable as well working with teams and then maybe a bit with the product owner depends on the situation however if we're talking about agile coaches who are truly passionate about helping your organization to improve and then there are also other arenas we need to work with so how is our product doing and also leadership team and then also about organization level of improvement what are we doing now and then also about the strategy. Where is my Scrap organization going? Organization can be big, maybe have different product lines and how each product line is doing, what the strategy moving forward, are we really facing very hot co competition? What can we do to get out of there? And also in terms of whole organization, in terms of culture and structure. So in short, as an agile coach, again, standing on my balancing board and we travel, as we see needed, we assess the situation into different areas or different arena in this large organization arena. And that is uh, very important so that we're not because normally we see for a new agile coach or new scrum master just getting started, they focus on teams and teams and teams. However, we need to look up for other areas, other small arenas uh, in this big organization arena. And then, so now if you to take a look at summary, and then, uh, so as we see, it's very important that we build the skill. And then the second one is being able to balance the skill we have. So for every, you know, when for the organization you're working in, being able to assess and evaluate. And then that way you continuously doing so, they can continuously travel into that small arena in this big setting going in there again you're always standing on your balancing board so that allow you to decide oh yeah i should actually go in to teach maybe now i could actually go in oh given the situation i could actually use more of a professional coaching skills however that is not the only default uh, standing of an agile coach and this is why that uh, um and Agile 100, <laughs> Sarab and Susie, when they reach out to say you are cold. And this is something I've been working with. So when I work with coaches, I always talk about the value. So in an organization, when we are working with an organization, if we don't have this value-driven strategy, and you can have the most fantastic team, and the team can only be so good. Actually, one of my mentee in Taiwan and his company actually just bankrupt because they have very good teams, quite good competence, and then very mature also in terms of uh, team development. However, the product sucked, the strategy sucked. So therefore, uh, it's very important to focus on value-driven strategy. And then now if we take a summary for our session, I hope that uh, remember the little competition that uh, uh, I talked about. So I hope that it kept track of all the takeaway messages from each of the topics. So uh, now, how about in uh, three minutes, please use chat window to send in as many takeaway messages you can. And then for the winner, so Rabha, of course, would do me the favor to count. And then I would love to offer you free monthly coaching circle activity, which I run for my mentees. And then it will be free for you to join on a monthly basis. And you will meet people just 
you know, passionate practitioner like you from uh, different countries, 68 countries as of today. So now if we, uh, let's get ready. So now is 39.20 on my clock. So we run it for three minutes. Now you can start. So Evelyn, how do you determine the winner then? We, I, is it the, is it the quantity <laughs> of, of responses yeah, or? <laughs> well, now, uh, given that it's an online session with the interaction uh, we have, we would do quantity over quality. Okay. That. that make your okay. job easier as well. <laughs> that, that, could be a, that could be a lot of waste though. <laughs> I agree, <laughs> but let's just have some fun. It's an important to have fun, isn't okay. it? <laughs> and, and and will you announce the winner then right away, or do you want to? And will you announce them later? You will count, right? So okay, you, ah, okay, I have to count. Okay. To you. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Let's so see you're giving all the difficult tasks to me. <laughs> let's see how feasible it is for you to count. If not, we copy paste. Then we do. I will do the admin work after. Then we'll reach out the. Uh, to the winner who have the most um, number of uh, takeaway messages. And we only get one winner or can we get two? If we have a tie or it's quite close. Okay. Uh, certainly, yeah. Okay, so I'll do my best to count well. Thank you. <laughs> if it's difficult, Shara, I don't want to burden you too no, much. No, no, I like that. I like competitions. <laughs> Actually, I like competitions more if I can participate myself, but this time I'm, I'm the jury. Yeah, same here. You know, I do. Uh, when I talk about um, competing, talk about conflict, and sometimes I normally joke and say, you know, don't you have a friend? Maybe like Sarab, if you uh, continuously winning the game, he's gonna tell you you will not go home until I win. <laughs> yes, that that's how I work. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> Okay, so roughly we have two minutes past. We have one more minute left. Okay, so currently we have two front runners, Frances okay. and Aneta, both of them with two responses. Fantastic. Uh, Frances is going now up with three. Aneta, yeah. come on, I know you can do it. Yeah, keep going. We have <laughs> roughly about uh, 35 seconds left. I'm keeping, keeping the counter. Oh. More people chiming in. Okay. I know it's kind of, I know my husband complained, it's unfair. I type so slowly, but there are many things in my head. <laughs> but uh, let's just have some fun. Also, that allow you to reflect on your takeaway message and also seeing what other participants actually come up with. Yes, that's good. Okay, so we have five more seconds. So five, four, and three. And two and one. All right. I think we have two winners. One is one is Frances. Uh, he or she provided four or five things, and then also Werner, who only did one post, but in that one post, he had five key takeaways and he numbered them. So I would say I would say two winners. Fantastic! Congratulations. Yeah. We'll, uh, so Rob, you will pass that to me and then I, I'll get in touch with you. Thank you so much to you all for your participation. As I said, takeaway message is always important. Yeah? So then let's take a look at the whole takeaway message. Remember the title of my presentation is the inspiration trap. So it's more like what do we do now um, when we look at inspiration. So Inspirations are valuable, very valuable, and then, however, unfortunately, happen to trap us as well. So, uh, uh, first, and I believe that it's definitely great to seek for inspirations and check what others are doing, you actively share as well. At the same time, it's also very important to understand thoroughly to be able to carefully analyze your own situation and decide what the next steps will be. So that is putting that together. That will be the three steps I have as recommendation with regards to inspiration. And then with that, and I'm also pretty much uh, concluding my content. So thank you so much for attending this session and I think about Agile, I think about product, I think about organization all the time. So please feel invited to reach out to me. 
And then uh, thank you again for your time. Cool. So Evelyn. Yeah, I'm gonna stop yes. with that, right? would, you, would you mind unsharing your, yes, perfect. So yeah. let, okay. let's, let's engage in, in, in a few minutes of Q&A. We have just a few minutes left. Um, you talked a lot about value and waste. And there were some questions in the chat about how did the organizations that you work with actually measure value and waste, both from a technical perspective, like how did they do the measurement, but also from what did they consider as value and what did they consider as waste? As you, you mentioned, there are different types of waste. So yeah. how did that all happen? Okay, great. A very, very great question. Huh? So first, uh, when I spoke about the value stream mapping, so, you know, just the first exercise to truly get this end-to-end -end picture, that could be very powerful. So many organizations, these were, of course, talking about large organizations, they actually have trouble to put the whole end-to-end -end on the same page. So normally when I facilitate such a session, you know, um, I have actually have not done that virtually. So physically, you know, the whiteboard that's a few meter long, Normally, I start to introduce what they need to do and ask them to actually start to draw the very beginning. We have that customer interaction, blah, 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 and goes on until the moment we actually deliver to customer. And normally, actually, I normally sneak out for coffee. Do you know why? Because it will be start to have very hard discussion and to actually start to figure out, okay, after I finish, well, what do I do? Or oh, it's like, where do I get this? So all these discussions, just a preliminary, preliminary step to actually have that uh, visualized, that's already one step forward. This, again, we're talking about the whole entire value flow. Yeah. And second thing is about the question of about how do you know what's value? And then that is depends on, of course, remember I kept mentioning about your product and your services or solution. So that in context. You need to define exactly what is the value we're delivering to the customer and how that gets started and how that actually gets delivered. So that can be something very important to, to focus on. Another thing about how do you actually identify waste. Once we get this first, uh, and you know, from the moment customer comes in and the, the, at the end, we actually deliver that to the customer, the next thing we want to do is as a simple step, as uh, uh, my presentation slides showed, having start to identify just from the simple calendar time to start to use the basic value stream mapping tool to say, okay, for this particular thing I'm doing, for instance, analyzing the customer needs. Yeah. And then the thing is that because of all these multiple value stream in the organization, because every a lot of multitasking that's happening, although to analyze what exactly startups needs are, and actually, let's say I actually, if I could sit down, it's actually only take me a day. However, because all the things that's happening, and then maybe I spent five calendar days. So start to look at just from a timeline perspective and also looking into what are the things that actually, you know, that actually lead to wait, the waiting time. Because if you're producing something in the hardware manufacturer floor, you can visualize. If for instance, assume I'm too fast, then Sarab will have a lot of things piling up. We can visualize it. However, in most cases, product and also services, there is a queue. However, we don't see it. So with this, it's going to help us to see exactly what's happening, to see with that as a trigger to reflect on how we work. Okay, cool. But, but I mean, it, it, it's not easy, right, to, to do this. Well, even depending also on the industries that you're in, I think there can be some difficulties. But creating this must, must have been like very insightful for everyone in the organization, especially the, the leaders in those orgs. And, and then it would be interesting to know like what kind of, what kind of decisions did they take based on that. Now I'm going to leave the, the, the world of waste and, and value a bit because there was another question from yeah. Jörg. And uh, I think this is related to your very international background. He wants okay. to know, do you see differences while introducing Agile in different countries, cultures at the globe? As you've been China, Europe, mainly like Scandinavia, but also probably in, in the US and Canada. Yeah. 
So I do see a difference. For instance, uh, I back the days I was working in Ericsson, I was dispatched in Asia. For instance, just a simple example, when I was working with the leaders in Japan, uh, within Ericsson, so it already sort of Ericsson culture in there. What happened was that after, for instance, I talk about something, what do you guys think? Which, which is a powerful open question. And then what happened? Silence. And then that you have to you have to learn about the culture, which is a Japanese friends in general. Of course, um, you know if people have been living abroad, this could change. And then if they still have eye contact with you when you ask, that means I want to speak, call my name. Uh, if I don't have anything to say, I'll look down when you're asking. So that is certainly already one angle. And I run uh, a workshop and exercises and also cultural part of so people react differently. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, in Sweden, as we know, there is a culture of uh, people are relatively conflict aware. So working as coaches, particularly working with executives, my, I always joke, my years are like a rabbit. <laughs> so long trying to really read the emotion and the words they're saying because they are not like for instance uh, in some other culture in north america i could see one of my clients the people say yeah i don't quite agree with you sarab and that you will not see uh then instead is more from the long message and the embedded messages that i don't agree with you so there is definitely a lot of that uh, so therefore that culture aspect yes you have to consider that and now people are working you know uh, very internationally people are moving around so maybe in your team you actually maybe a team of eight people you might actually have uh, people coming in from three four maybe even more countries so that's a factor we need to consider yeah at my company, actually, we are a team of eight people, and we are from six different countries. So <laughs> quite international. All yeah. right, Evelyn, we're at the end of our time box. Um, we so appreciate you joining us. Thank you for that presentation. Thank you also for the competition that you ran and the, and the two winners. One of them I already emailed to you um, their email address. The other wanted to contact you directly based on having your email address on the on the final slide. Thank you so much again, and it was great hosting you here. Thank you, and thank you again. Bye.